Hello, and welcome to the Game Changers podcast. I'm Sue Anstis, and this is where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. A huge thank you to our partners, Sport England, who are kindly supporting the next three series of the Game Changers through the National Lottery. It's hard to know where to start in describing my guest today. Kelly Lindsay is a former professional footballer who's also played in the US national team. Since retiring as a player, she's coached teams across the world in the US, Hong Kong, Afghanistan and Morocco. And last year was appointed as performance director at Lewis FC, the first gender equal football club in the UK. Kelly is renowned for her passion and courage in tackling some of the less attractive issues in women's football, whether it's being a voice for the voiceless in support of female players in Afghanistan or calling out those in the highest positions of leadership at national and international federations, Kelly's doing so much to ensure that football can truly be a game for all. Kelly, there is so much I want to explore with you. But first, congratulations on your latest role. It's a club that's very close to my heart, as you know. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about your work at Lewis later on. But I have to ask, when you think of all the jobs you could have taken globally, what attracted you to this fabulous little town on the south coast of England? Uh, I mean, equality. It's very simple, especially when you're a woman in the game and you've grown up privileged, even if I didn't know it when I was growing up. And then I've traveled the world and I've seen the great inequalities for women just to be human beings, let alone to actually play sport, to have a club that's going to use football as a tool to advocate for equality and equity and treating humans as they should be treated. It just sort of was a perfect fit with everything I've done in my career up to this point. And it's a long, long way from Omaha, Nebraska. So can you tell me about life growing up there and and how you started in in playing football, soccer yourself? (laughs) Nebraska is a wonderful place to grow up. You know, when you're a kid, you... You don't know what you don't know, of course, in life. And so I didn't realize maybe how special it was and how unique it was. But I was really raised by a wonderful family, but also a wonderful community. All the coaches who took me through my grade school years, my middle school years, my high school years, I'm still in contact with many of them. We really were raised to sort of do well for others and take care of each other. So I think that that really stuck in my veins and has helped me on my career. But I started football like many people do. Soccer. I don't even call it soccer anymore. (laughs) Football like many people do. My brother was playing. Um, (laughs) He was a few years older than me. And I basically turned to my parents and said, I want to play. And I was only four years old. So when they went to sign me up, I wasn't old enough to start playing. They said I had to wait one more year unless my dad would coach. So my dad is not a soccer guy. He was not a coach. But he became my first football coach and he led me all the way into high school. So great thanks to my dad for reading books and trying to learn how to be a soccer coach along the way. (laughs) And how was women's soccer perceived at the time within the States? You know, I remember at five years old, I was sitting on the edge of my bed looking at this poster on my wall. My dad came in. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to play for that team one day. And he looked up at the poster and he said, well, then you better get working. And the poster was, I think, of the 1988 U.S. men's national team. We didn't have a women's national team at the time or not one that anyone knew about. But it was great that my dad said that because I never really thought about men and women's sports. I didn't put myself into a category that said, oh, I'm a woman. I can't do this. And with his comment that day at a very young age, I think that stuck with me. So It was probably around university time, like high school, when women's soccer really started to take off and more universities were having it because of Title IX and the women's national team was starting to really take off. So, yeah, it didn't phase me when I was young, but I do realize looking back that we didn't have those role models until I was probably in high school. And you went on in 2001, you were named Rookie of the Year and you were the number one first draft round pick for the San Jose Cyber Rays in the US Professional Women's Soccer League at the time. But your career finished sooner than planned at just 23. So what happened there? Well, I was shocked to be first round draft pick because I had already had about eight knee surgeries from the age of 13 till I graduated from college. So Really, I went into the draft not thinking anyone would pick me. I was injury prone. I had all these knee surgeries that couldn't be explained. And it was a shock to me that I actually got drafted. And then to be drafted first was um, 
a highlight, but also a little bit of what are these guys thinking? Why are they picking me? I'm the youngest player in the league. I've had <laughs> what do they see in me? But that was the best thing that ever happened to go to the San Jose Cyber Ace because the general manager and the head coach just forever have become lifelong mentors and friends of mine and really took me on a journey from being a very young kid to a professional athlete, a professional person um, and changed my life forever. And why did you stop then at 23? Was that because of the surgeries? In this, I think, 2002 season, I had a really bad surgery that turned into some health complications and it was really difficult for me to come back from it. You know, when you can't get out of bed at night to go to the bathroom, when you can't actually sit and get up, you feel like you're 90 years old when you're only in your early 20s. Um, I just sort of hit that phase of my life of like, is it worth it? Am I going to be able to walk when I'm older? Can I keep doing this? How much longer? And so about midway through that season, I called my head coach. I remember driving along the road and I just picked up the phone and called him and said, listen, I think I'm going to have to retire at the end of this year. I just, I physically can't do this anymore. And he just had the best comment of, you might retire from playing, but you're not going to retire from the cyber rays. You're just going to come back on and be our assistant coach and stay with us. And that was a really powerful moment to show that you don't always have to be the player to make an impact on a team and a squad. And that, even though that didn't happen because the league folded after that season, it gave me that little spark through the rest of the year that there was a career beyond just being a, an athlete and a player. And was that your next step then into coaching? I know you went to Sky Blue. Was that straight up? Was that kind of that progress through to that role? Um, so in the U.S. in 2003 was the last season of the WUSA. And then there was about a six year gap before the next professional league started which is when Sky oh, wow. Blue came in. Okay. In the U.S. at that point in women's soccer, um, the highest level of coaching really was university coaching. So all the universities, I mean, we have thousands of universities in the country who require very professional credentials to coach for them and all this. So that was our sort of professional leagues, if you will. So I coached across the university for, I think, about five or six years until that gap was filled. And then I was at a university job when I got called to come to Sky Blue and, and help be the assistant coach there initially. And then you won the league as head coach mm -hmm. at Sky Blue, I believe. So what do you uh, attribute that to? Were you coaching, do you think, in a different way to other coaches in the league at the time? Well, I think one thing that has always sat with me, whether I knew it or not, was I'm just a huge, huge believer in, in culture and creating sort of a champion culture to champion every individual to be their unique self, to champion the team, that they champion each other, that everyone is trying to work towards this more high performance lifestyle, high performance mindset. And I think that year, you know, to win any championship takes luck. Don't get me wrong. And we had our ups and downs. We were bottom of the league. Uh, I don't think we had won a game for our first four or five games. It didn't look good. It didn't look positive, but I think when you have that culture and that mindset and that drive and you just have this long term vision that even if we didn't do it this year, we want to do it next year. We always want to be champions in our life on and off the pitch. And ultimately, at some point, it just sort of all came together for the players and they were a unique squad. They had that connection and unity off the pitch. They would do anything for each other. And that's what wins championships. I mean, everyone can do the technical side. Everyone can do tactics at this level. But when you really build that culture that human beings protect each other, trust each other, fight for each other in the worst of times, that's how you win championships. So a lot of credit to that team for going through the hard times and sticking together and not getting off track. And in the end, they came through with the championship. And do you believe that you need to coach men and women differently? I think you coach every single human being differently. Like every human is a unique individual. It doesn't matter if they're male, they're female, their culture, their background. You, you just really have to connect with who they are as a human because they all have different values. They all have a different vision. They all have a different purpose in life. They've all come from a different background. And I almost start every year with teams of just like, we're all from completely different backgrounds. There's not one background in this room that's the same. So from this moment forward, let's come together and let's learn each other and start developing our own future together, whatever that's going to be. And to me, it doesn't matter if it's men or women, like humans are humans and they want, we want connection. We want trust. We want people who care about us. And when you do that, you can get anyone to, to sort of progress and move forward. Fantastic answer. Uh, that's, so, that's so true though, isn't it? I think there is a, a, very much that kind of belief that it's either or, but I love that idea that actually we are all 
unique individuals, aren't we? Can you we move on then to look at how you came to be the coach of the uh, Afghanistan women's team? I'd love to kind of know how that came about in the first place. <laughs> You know, some things just happen in life. Uh, you know, Julie Foudy, who's one of our greatest legends of the U.S. Women's National Team, um, she always ran these sports leadership camps. And I was obviously big into sports leadership and the power it has for women to sort of develop themselves on and off the pitch. So I had done a number of camps with her. And through that time, she always tries to bring in sort of players from around the world who aren't in as privileged a situation as we are. So throughout a number of years, there had been a number of Afghan women's national team players that had come to these, to these camps over the summer. So I'd sort of gotten to know a few of them. And then one summer, one of them became my assistant coach for the camp. And we really connected over the time. And I started to hear all her stories about, I I had her speak a lot to our girls because I just thought you don't get this opportunity every day for someone from a completely different background and culture to talk to you about the sport you love, something you connect with. And I could feel, I could sense in her voice and her stories that there was just something really, really deep there that none of us would would understand. And I remember when she, when we departed ways, I said, if there's ever any way I can help, you just let me know. When you're living in the U.S., it's difficult because you can't get visas for Afghan women to travel the world. So it, it was almost impossible to bring them to the U.S. and do anything to support them, give them games, give them coaching, give them leadership. But A few months later, I moved to Hong Kong. And when I was in Hong Kong, I noticed they took a trip to Japan. And I thought, ah, this is the window to help them. I'm running a wonderful club in Hong Kong. The people here would totally embrace them. I can get our male coaches to really show them respect and coach them as unique individuals. Like we could do such a great program for them. So uh, I reached out and said, if you guys have an interest, we will fundraise everything and we'll bring you over here and we'll really lead the way. Push comes to shove. And as you work around the world, you realize not everyone really wants women to succeed. So although I thought that was a great idea, I'm not sure the Federation really thought that that was a wonderful idea. But time moved on and Halita Popal had gotten back in with the Federation, was trying to lead this new project to sort of reinvigorate women's football in Afghanistan and not only build the women's team, but build a pathway below. So somehow she got my number and we just started chatting. And I think at first she wanted some advice and eventually she was like, we have a big project and we need a coach and you seem to understand who we are and what we need. And and so we said, we'd give it a try. We would, first of all, we'd go around the world and try to find Afghan players who could help lead the women's team to really become successful on the international level. So our goal was nationalism will trump sexism in the country. So how do we build a successful team that the men of Afghanistan will be proud of? Because if they're proud of a sports team, it doesn't matter if they're men or women. If someone's winning, suddenly countries buy into female sports. So that was our mission and that was our goal. And we came together and it was a long project to get it started. But Halid and I hit it off and then we kept bringing staff in and it just sort of escalated into something quite beautiful and quite powerful for the women, which was way bigger than I ever imagined you know football is football sport is sport but it does transform lives and tell us about how important it was to those the the women that were still in Afghanistan that were playing how did it playing football affect them and their lives yeah women especially at that time I mean they weren't really free to walk on the street if they were wearing sports clothing they had rocks thrown at them stones thrown at them they were um, called prostitutes Uh, they were just not really allowed to be their true self, not allowed to live their their free life. They couldn't go anywhere without a man to walk them there, to protect them, whether it was their brother or their uncle or their father. They just lived such a sheltered life. And football was a vision for them to do a couple things, to prove that women were real human beings, to prove to the rest of their country, to prove to men in their country, to prove to women in their country that women were strong, uh, that they had value, that they had a future, that they should get an education. It really was like a spark for many things. It was also um, a bit of freedom, especially when they got to travel. When we took them out of the country and traveled, they got to see the world. A lot of them didn't have consistent electricity. They don't have consistent internet connection. They might have bits and pieces here and there, but even when we tried to contact them and stay in touch with them, it could be three or four days without any electricity or internet connection. So, you know, sometimes you didn't know where the players were and if they were okay, especially when different things were happening in the country. 
But the most important thing the girls really wanted to do through football was just show women in the country you can step out of your house and live your life. And I just thought that was such a powerful statement. Like they're playing football to show women in their country you can leave your home. I've never thought like that before. And I remember when they said it, I almost had like a, really, that's why we're playing? But over the years of working with them, it became so powerful. Like this opportunity to kick a ball around and play sport was going to show every woman in the country they had the right to leave their home. They had the right for education. They had the right to stand up for their human rights. They had the right to have a voice. They had a right to go to the police if they were being abused or or legal issues. It just started this transformation in the country, which became so powerful. And I was I really shocked to hear, I guess, some of those attitudes. We, we talked about nationalism trumping sexism, but some of those attitudes to the national players, something we would be incredibly proud of here playing for your country, wasn't viewed in the same way by families or communities and so on. So was that a surprise to you? And how did you feel when you discovered and saw that attitude? It wasn't a surprise, I guess, because obviously we've heard stories of Afghanistan and we sort of know what's going on there. We definitely don't know, but we have a sense or a glimpse. I think what shocked me the most from working with the girls was like this idea that their closest family members might not have supported them, which, okay, might sound normal, but like their mothers, their brothers, their fathers telling them they can't go to football, telling them they can't travel on a trip. The things these girls did to go on a trip We actually had a girl who had a twin sister. And so when she came on the trip, her twin pretended to be both sisters for like 15 days at home so that she could be on the trip playing football. And, uh, you know, when you hear those stories, you just think this means so much to them. But I think the thing that shocked me most was the pressure on family. So if I was a father that supported my daughter, I was abused by my community. I could have been stoned. I was abused verbally. I was called names. I was sort of shunned from the community. So that stretched to mothers, fathers, uncles, cousins, brothers, grandfathers. So it wasn't just the girl that was enduring it. It was the entire family and the entire community. And that actually shocked me quite a lot and made me think, man, these girls are strong and powerful to go through every single day trying to make this happen when everyone's against them. And did you see shifts? So we talk about that kind of changing attitudes over the time that you were involved. Did you see a a shift in attitude? Huge shift. I mean, social media, when we first took over the team, social media was just abusing the girls. And they were going to tournaments and events and they were getting beat 15 nil, 22 nil, 12 nil. I mean, they were just getting annihilated. And This is always one thing when I think about developing the game is you don't just want to put females out there to tick a box. You want to make sure they're prepared and they're ready to perform. Otherwise, yeah, society doesn't accept them and they think they're weak and they're incapable. But the truth of that matter was the Federation didn't train them, didn't give them 11 aside pitch, didn't give them proper educated coaches. So, of course, when they go into an international arena, they're going to get annihilated by an opponent who's been training regularly, has professional coaches, has professional standards. So you can't just take what you see and accept it. You need to look deeper and understand why these things are happening. But as we worked with them, and and we still, we maybe got beat 5-0, but the countries we were playing against were just amazed at our organization. They were amazed at our girls' heart, at our girls' fight. Um, And you could see that huge progress. And suddenly we started to actually film every game from an iPhone and put it on the internet. And we did it so that Afghan men could see these girls play because nobody else in the world was going to put us on the internet. Nobody else in the world was going to show these women who weren't good enough playing on the international stage. So we started to post it on Facebook and YouTube and we wanted the men to see how strong. And then suddenly there was a lot more positivity coming through because they could see their heart. They could see their passion. They could see they were footballers. They were organized. And it totally started to change perspective. Of course, we still got the abuse we got, but um, you could sense that when you showed they were professional athletes, they could do this, that people started to get on board. You mentioned the the Federation and and lack their support there, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about fearless football. And I'd urge anyone to watch the video of your speech at its launch back in 2019. And I will share a link to that in the show notes too. It's incredibly moving and and powerful. So can you tell me about this campaign and and how it came about? 
after our trip um, to Jordan with the women's national team, we started to hear murmurs of abuse happening inside the Federation. And to be very honest, we were ignorant. We didn't know what to do. I had never in my time ever as a coach or a player faced and understood abuse. No one's ever educated me on what to do. I didn't know the pathway to be able to raise it in the right channels. So when we first heard about the abuse, we raised it to the Afghan Football Federation, as you would suspect that you should. Obviously, we got spun around, no help. So we kept investigating and kept trying to figure out what was going on. Eventually, we raised it to FIFA, and we felt the same thing. I felt from the very beginning, FIFA didn't want to put their hands on it. They didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to deal with abuse. We do football. We don't do abuse. And our push to them is this this abuse is happening in football. It is your responsibility to make sure the players are safe. It, it's your vision that says that every human being should be able to play football in a safe environment. We have a national team and youth national teams being affected by sexual abuse done by the people in the federation. If you're not going to help us, who who is? So it took, I mean, it was probably over a year um, before we sort of rallied a troop around the world, a group of people from all different backgrounds in sport and football to sort of help us think through how, how do we actually deal with abuse in football? Because at that time, nobody was really talking about it. I know we had had some cases, a big case in the UK. There was the big gymnastics case in the US. But these were sort of like this highlighted case, and then it sort of got brushed away. It wasn't like anything in the world was being done to stop it, to understand it, really, to educate. I mean, if I'm a coach that's been at quite a high level around the world, and no one's ever spoke to me or educated me on abuse and how you deal with it. It just became very eye-opening to me that this is a huge issue. And obviously when we raised it with the Afghan team, we had women coaches around the world contacting us saying, we have a similar case. Can you help us? Can you help us? And I, I always say I was just a coach. I don't know, actually, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how to bring these cases to the point. So fearless football was a collaboration of a number of officials around the world who sort of came together and say, we need to raise our voice. We need to make sure that FIFA and other international, national, local governing bodies start to pay attention, that we start to put a structure and a process in place to solve this. And we hold them accountable. I mean, really trying to hold FIFA accountable that you might not solve it, but it's your responsibility to start. It's your responsibility to have the dialogue. It's your responsibility to think about the structure. And for me, it's their responsibility to fund it, to make sure that around the world, every single player and coach knows exactly where to go to if these cases arise. Because almost every case I heard was the same patterns. Um, It seemed like we could solve this much quicker. But due to so many imbalances around the world, how does a young player who doesn't speak English contact FIFA? and make sure that their voice is heard if they're being abused in their local football community. So there's a lot of work to be done. And Fearless Football was sort of our first step to put it on a really international basis to ask people to step up and start thinking about it, start organizing, uh, start working towards a solution and holding uh, governing bodies accountable. And and it has had incredible impact across the world. I, I remember um, reading Susie Rack's in-depth reporting of it in The Guardian. And I think like you, it's like we had no idea. It f- felt so remote, something going off in a far place of the world, but actually it, it's repercussions uh, for all you know women, all athletes playing sport in that way. Where do you feel now with fearless football and, and what more still needs to be done? The concept of fearless football, I'm very proud of. And but we have a a long way to go. Uh, I'm still very frustrated with international governing bodies. Um, I don't think that FAs are taking it seriously. I don't think that FIFA is being a leader on this. I don't think that there's a strong voice and I don't think they've got their own ducks in a row and that they've really cleaned up their own house. I think they still want to sort of buy their way out of it versus really create a robust independent structure that operates at the local level, the regional level, the national, the international level that really takes these cases through the correct processes and make sure that people are held accountable. And I think FIFA has to make an extremely strong statement that abuse in football is just not acceptable on any level. And we're going to do everything we can to put structures in place that Athletes, coaches, referees, staff know exactly where to go and how to process 
these allegations because it's extremely difficult to work your way through through the system. And if you're not educated and you don't speak English and you don't have the money for a lawyer, I don't actually know how someone can progress through an allegation and uh, feel like they've accomplished and and have respite for for the process. Especially as in the case of the Afghanistan team, the most senior man in the Federation who you might raise your complaint and issue to, but he was at the heart of the issues in the first place. Yeah, and I think uh, around the world, I've really seen that, that these um, highest officials typically know what's going on, whether they're actively involved or, or they're helping uh, cover up what's going on. Uh, what I've learned is internationally, you can't go to those highest officials. You need an independent, uh, robust organization who you can go to and speak to. And you really need people who have been through the process. You need people who understand. I mean, to be able to speak about abuse, to be able to be a whistleblower, uh, it's very personal. I mean, I think still to this day, I have some PTSD around it. When the topic comes up, I really get emotional about it <laughs> because it, it it destroys lives and when people don't know how to deal with it, they put you through so much trauma on the process to to raise your voice. Nobody ever explained to ourselves as whistleblowers or to our players what they were going to have to go through. So every time you thought, OK, we've done what we need to do, we were put through another traumatic interview process, another traumatic tribunal, another, you know, and it just the amount of trauma our girls went through to raise their voices I hope, I hope that um, eventually we get to a point that humans don't have to go through that because they never asked to be abused and they should never have been abused in sport. And it's just not right that we don't have systems in place that understand how to process this appropriately. Last year, we saw abuses exposed in the NWSL and the repercussions that followed. Do you think we're finally seeing female athletes are able to talk, as you've alluded to there, about what happened to them? Have we had a, a Me Too movement in sport with about athlete A and all that's happening, or do you feel that is still to come? I think we've had the start of a Me Too movement. I think women are starting to understand they do have a voice and that people will listen. And I think there are they have a very powerful voice in many countries, but with a powerful voice in some countries, there's still, there's probably even more target to shut down voices in other countries. And so I really think as a global community, um, we need to make sure that we're reaching out and we're understanding the plight of other women uh, around the world. Because coming from the U.S., I never would have understood what was happening in Africa and Asia. I was just so far removed from that. Um, and it took me a little time as I sort of started to travel and see other cultures to realize, wow, uh, we have a lot of work to do as women. And I am extremely privileged. So for all of my complaints and everything that I might gripe about on a daily basis, these are first world problems and first world privileges. And we really need to, to interact and understand what women are coming, where they're coming from in their own countries. Uh, I think to fully take on this problem because Me Too happens everywhere. Abuse happens everywhere. There is no country and no human that that is not a part of it in some way. Um, and I just think it's so important we start to open those worlds of dialogue and we help each other and we listen. And you, along with others in the football community, played a huge role in helping in the evacuation members of the Afghanistan women's team last year. Can you talk us through what happened there and the action that you took? You know, people have given us on the outside a lot of credit. And I just want to start by saying the women on the inside, the women who had to fight through the streets, the women who had to be brave enough to walk out of their homes at that moment, at that time in Afghanistan, the women who had to leave their families behind. I mean, they are they are the brave ones. They are the ones that made this happen. What I will say is no, nothing happens in life without good lawyers and I mean, the amount of paperwork that went in in order to get these women through the gate at the airport in a time of a global crisis is is just crazy to me that to save lives, you had to have all the paperwork, all the stamps, all the checks. And, you know, when you're on the inside as a human, you just think enough with the bureaucracy, get them to safety and deal with all that when they're out of the country. But um, we had a wonderful team behind the scenes of about eight of us. And there was a network of 
40, 50, 60 people around the world who just, we, it was just constant WhatsApp messages for weeks. It was a crazy time. It was a 24 seven operation and literally an operation. We had players getting stuck at a uh, Taliban checkpoint. We had two year old babies getting crushed in the street, trying to get them to a hospital. We had families getting separated. We had families standing in the sewer for eight plus hours, hoping they get picked out to go inside the gate. People inside the gate, not knowing where they were going next. Ticks on their hands that said, you're through or you're not. I mean, just absolute craziness. Um, So when the first wheels went up and we had about 74 on that first flight, I'll never forget. We had 10 seconds of celebration. And then we said, all right, we got to get the rest. Everyone back on point. We just, we didn't even take the time to enjoy it or celebrate it. It was just back to, we got that. Who can we get next? How do we break this down one more time? Do you think that we were perhaps naive in in the ambition of what those young women in Afghanistan could do, both for their their country and globally? Do you have any regrets in terms of all that we did to to help raise their profile? Because ultimately that was the bit that then uh, made them be centre of attention when when everything happened with the Taliban. Yeah, I think when it first happened and you realise it's Western ignorance. You know, we want to promote the women's game and we want to put these women on profile and we want to help them change the culture of their country only to realize that their country was so fragile. And as soon as the Westerners left, they were back in Taliban hands. And yeah, we, we made them targets, you know, and I think we took that very personal. And I th- hope that the rest of the world can also look at that and realize we do put people at targets because we are ignorant. We don't actually understand what's going on day to day in other countries. So there's one side that we took it really personal. I was really destroyed by it for a little while as we were going through this and really had to reflect a bit. The other side of that is they have learned a lot and they will be stronger for having gone through this. They've learned that they have a voice. They learned that they have human rights. Let's just stop there. They learned as women in a country who didn't respect them that they have human rights. And if that message just trickles to the next generation and the next generation, I think many countries like Afghanistan, they're 50 plus years away from a transformation. But that 50 years is five generations of understanding that they have rights and they have a voice and they can stand up for themselves and that people around the world care and will also support them, which is very, very difficult. Um, So there's a sense of responsibility that we did put them in that. And there's also a sense of pride that hopefully they will pass this on to the next generation and the next generation. And they will be able to transform the the lives of the women in their country. And it's been wonderful to see some of the players arriving in the UK. So what more can we do to help those women and their families moving forwards? Yeah, I think what's probably so difficult about being a refugee is you're literally plucked out of your life and and dropped into a whole new world. You don't understand the language. You don't understand the culture. I'm an American coming to England. I'm still learning the culture. It's quite different than I'm used to. And we speak the same language, but to to accomplish daily things and to sort of build your life in a new country, you, you have to understand the bureaucracy and the systems and the structures and the timelines which is very complicated and and difficult, even if you're educated and you speak the language. So I think there's a number of organizations who have stepped in to try to help our women. And it would be great to have people step in and and be a part of those organizations, whether that is funding or uh, everyone here has skills and talents that you could teach. Sometimes it's just spending time. It's just making them feel human. Uh, This word refugee is terrible. We have such a negative perspective on it. These are amazing, brilliant people coming to our country to bring new skills and and new ideas and and new ways of doing things. And we can learn more from them than they can probably learn from us. And I think to take a little bit of time and, and engage with them as human beings and really bring them on this journey. If we plucked you out and stuck you in a foreign country that you didn't speak the language, you'd be so grateful for one person to spend their time and energy with you, you know? And I think so that just human contact and human care, they're going to be learning English. So it could be a Zoom call. It can be simple things, you know, writing the letter, writing an email, because all those skills will add up and build up. And most important that they feel welcome and a part of of the country, not as refugees and should be shunned to the side. I, I just think that's so, so important that we invite them into the country and help them have a good positive start.
Fabulous. A fabulous message for, for all those people that are coming to the country in whatever circumstances too, isn't it? But I can share in the show notes some of the links to organisations that are supporting the Afghan females and, and also their families too. As we discussed at the beginning, you're here in the UK, whatever the language challenges of British to American, but you're at Lewis FC. So can you tell us a little bit about your day-to-day role as performance director? So I oversee the men, the women, and our youth pathway. And right now we're on a very strategic journey into the future to see um, how we can elevate the men and the women up the ranks. And we want to develop a robust, unique player pathway underneath them that really helps develop individuals to become professional humans and hopefully professional players along the way, but professional humans is first. So Lewis is an amazing place because they really believe in the values of taking care of individual people on the journey of life. And I think we're all quite focused on if we develop professional human beings, if we develop high quality, high performing human beings, they will help society. And if they can continue to play football, they will also help our football teams. But most important, we want to help society through football. We want to make sure that all the people that come through our program actually can go out into the world and make it a better place. And we speak quite profoundly about the things we stand for, and we use football as that vehicle. So it's exciting times. Both our men and our women have the potential to promote this year. Obviously a challenge. you got to have a little luck. But if not this year, we definitely want in the coming years to promote into the WSL, promote into the Men's National League. We really want to take the the club on a journey. And you've obviously got a great perspective of women's football globally from the various roles you've had. So how different have you found the setup and attitude to the women's game in the UK? I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm quite shocked. (laughs) I just feel like it's a first world country. It's 2022 and we're still having to claim that women's sports is acceptable. It boggles my mind. I've seen that from the outside. And that's one reason I really wanted to come to England. Is this really what's going on? And I've tried to take myself around to many men's and women's games of all different leagues just to understand the football culture, regardless about, you know, tactics and all that, just to understand this football culture. And I feel there's a movement. I feel it's progressing, but I really hope that, you know, football is for everyone and we need to make sure that it's fan friendly for all fans. We need to make sure that it's supported. I mean, it is like the infrastructure of this country is football and 50% of the population doesn't get to play at the same level. It's shocking to me, but hopefully uh, lots of good changes. And I see the FA getting on board and, uh, and clubs um, really striving to make sure that the women's game is represented and growing. So I see a lot of positivity, but I have to say, I was shocked that 2021 we're still having to negotiate that women's football is acceptable in a first world country. And clearly, women's football, as you said, is enjoying massive growth at the moment in terms of more professional contracts, sponsorship and and broadcast deals. It's easy almost to feel very optimistic about it all. But if you had to pick a couple of things that still need to improve, where do you see the priorities for women's football? And that could be UK or, or globally. Medical care. I think it's so, so important. Every athlete needs to be taken care of. Um, It's our bodies that we use to perform. We need to make sure there's a robust medical strategy, structure, funding, budgets around the medical care of female athletes, because you can't succeed if you're not taken care of from a young age and and your body managed. And with that then comes obviously all the performance side. Oftentimes women's football around the world is here's a coach, here's an assistant coach. You might get a goalkeeper coach once a once a week, once a month, get on with it. Like tick the box. We gave you a women's team. You really need the performance staff around it. You need the strength and conditioning. You need the psychology. You need the video analysis. The game is so detailed now. We need to teach players how to solve problems, how to be decision makers. And all that comes into the analysis, which I think oftentimes is left behind in the women's game. And you look at the men's game and they'll have they'll have 12 analysts, you know, um, and the women's game might have a part-time one. So I think those are huge, huge pieces. And then I just think it's the support. Like people always say the women's game doesn't get as many fans. So I just ask all the women out there in the world, go to a game. All the fathers of daughters, go to the games. Like it's actually quite a good level. It's fun to watch. I've never heard somebody go to an elite women's game and say, oh, that was crap. 
they're very good quality and many football fans are enjoying it more than the men's game. So to all the fans and all the supporters and all the people who say we want equality, put your money where your mouth is and pay for your ticket to go to the game. I think oftentimes people want to show up and get the free ride and the free ticket. I make sure every game I go to, I pay for it. I could get a free ticket, but it's important. We support the game and and we guide it forward. So um, don't hesitate to invest Put your bums in the seats and enjoy the game. I think you'll be quite surprised. And and finally, Kelly, what makes you most hopeful for the future of the women's game? All the future generations of women, I think. uh, Like I look at where the professional women are right now. They're going to be the huge change moving forward. And I really am grateful for the federations who are promoting female coaches who are really pushing women into the game. It's quite challenging to get women to step in and coach because society has told them they're not good enough and this isn't the field for them. And it's a really difficult field to work in sport as a woman when you have all these responsibilities outside the house and you're responsible for dinner and you're responsible for the kids and you have to take the kids to school and to this and that. Football is a 24-7 job. You rarely get holidays. You rarely get time off. So it's a really difficult field for women to get into. So I think if clubs and federations can start thinking, how do we structure it slightly different so women can be more engaged in these roles, the game will grow. So I'm very hopeful. I think it's changed a lot. There's a lot more women in it. I think all these professional players are learning the skills to be amazing on and off the pitch. Um, We've changed the mindset a bit, and now we just need another generation to come through and just keep pushing the envelope. And I think we have to stop saying thank you, or we appreciate it, or we're grateful, and we need to start saying more, we demand this, and we want this, and we deserve this, and we're going to take it, and we're going to take it together. And I think that's the most powerful thing about developing the women's game, is when we come together and we just make it happen, enough with people behind the scenes, just move past them, move together, make it happen, and uh, let's grow the game with or without their support. Wow, thanks so much to Kelly for taking the time to talk to me and sharing such a powerful story. She's an incredible woman and hearing all that makes me even prouder to be a director of Lewis FC. Kelly talked about the club's equality mission and Lewis is also 100% fan owned. So if you're passionate about equality, why not consider becoming an owner of the club from just £50? I will share a link in the show notes. Do visit fearlesswomen.co.uk where you can find out more about all of my amazing guests from this and the previous eight series. You can also listen to all the podcasts on the website or on all podcast platforms. And that's also where you can find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a network for women working in sport. You can sign up for Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in women's sport. And there's more about my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, also available in all good bookshops. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changers through the National Lottery and to Sam Walker, who is always wonderful in her role as executive producer of the podcast, along with Rory Ouskery on sound production. Finally, a big thank you to my brilliant colleague at Fearless Women, Kate Hannon. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. And if you fancy reviewing and rating the podcast, that would be excellent too. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. <laughs>